Our scripture reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 6 and read through verse 15. And we began this particular text last week, and it turned into a two-part series, and we'll be picking up on the second half of this today as Dan brings the word to us later on. And so here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Our Father in heaven, it is because of Christ that we can come before you even be called your children. You've given us life. You've given us your word and your truth and a hope which passes all the circumstances of our lives. And we pray that you would conform us into the image of your son today and help us to worship in spirit and in truth. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Maybe you've gone to the greeting card section in a store recently and you look through some of the sayings on them. Generally, you don't expect to find a lot of good theology in the messages that are on these cards. If you go into the anniversary section, you often find cards that communicate some view of love and fulfillment which relates to a view of humanity You often see a card that says, you complete me. What's the sender saying with something like that? That that I'm not complete on my own, but because of you I'm complete. Isn't that the the sentiment? And it expresses a a longing of a heart to be with another and finding another. So is that an accurate picture of how God made us? Are we incomplete on our own? I was looking around on the internet, interacting with that phrase that you see on that greeting card. Apparently it comes from a movie as well. And there's various responses. Some responses to the phrase affirm the importance of relationships in life and the longing that we have to be connected to something other than ourselves. But I also saw quite a few fairly negative responses as well. Statements like, I'm complete on my own. And only you can complete you. It's the spirit of independence. So how should we think of that? How do we think we become complete? Or are we already? We think about phrases like that, and we now need to reflect that in terms of the biblical view of a man. And there's a right sense that God made us for relationships. We're made in his image and as male and female. We're relational beings. And, and God said in the beginning it wasn't good to be alone, not just for companionship, but to accomplish his purposes, We're to be doing that together, reflecting him. But what is missed by the world is that our primary relationship for which we were made to flourish is with God, our maker. There's a thread through all of Biblical history, the story of redemption. In the beginning, of course, we had fellowship with God. We were dependent upon Him 
And then man, what did we do? We decided to choose for ourselves apart from his good instruction. We rebelled against our maker. And ever since, people have been trying to find their meaning, try to complete themselves in all sorts of ways. Who we are with is often one of those ways. Or who we make ourselves to be, what we achieve, what we acquire, what we enjoy. Sometimes it's measured by how we compare ourselves to others. Yet what God is doing in history is making a people for himself that look to him, that will call him their God, and and they will be his people, be unified in having him at the center of their lives, and the promise is that he will dwell with them. He will dwell with us. That's where we're going in biblical history. The end of the story in Revelation is that we will dwell with him as his people. Without this fellowship that we were intended for, without this relationship with our maker, a person is not complete. We are only complete in him. That's the title of our message, and that's what our passage is about. It's about being in him, being in Christ, and being made complete as we read through the passage. Hopefully that stood out. Paul's been writing to this fairly young church about the supremacy of, of Christ, all that he is, and and all that they have in him. And he's encouraging them to really understand who he is. As you've received him as the Lord, he is the Lord, he's the master of everything, he's the Savior, he's our treasure as we've been looking at. We're to walk in him, have our daily lives, our conduct in him. Last week we saw what a difference that is between just saying walk in obedience He doesn't say walk in obedience. It says walk in him. This isn't about just keeping a bunch of rules, but somehow our lives are connected to Christ. We're rooted in him, being built up in him and established in him, as we saw last week in verse 7. What we're talking about is, as we noted, is what's called union with Christ, like a marriage union when Two people are joined together. We participate in life together. And that's what we want to continue to talk about this week. For the Colossians, Paul wants them to understand all that they have in Christ. So he he spends quite a bit of verbiage describing that. One of the ways that we keep Christ as our treasure is not to leave it covered up And then just look at all the other temptations and what the world holds up as precious jewels. But instead to assess the treasure and the worth that we have in Christ and delight in him. And that makes everything else grow dim. And so for right living, Paul continues to encourage them positively in verses 9 to 15 by pointing out some of the facets of this treasure so that we can examine them from different angles And we're going to look at three particular facets of being in Christ, who is our treasure. We're going to look at, as it says in your bulletin, fullness, fellowship, freedom. And really these serve as three reasons not to add to Christ, like some of the teachers were doing in Colossae, but so that they would know and we would know the preciousness that we have in him. So let's start by looking at fullness. As we look at uh, verses 9 and 10, there's really two kinds of fullnesses being spoken of. I don't know what it's, how it strikes you, but hopefully you spend time reading large portions of Scripture. An epistle is meant to be read in one sitting. And if you sit down and read through Colossians, the doctrine, the teaching about Christ jumps off the page. This passage here, and a few weeks ago, remember in chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, Paul just seems to break out in talking about how incomparable Christ is, his preeminence. He made all things, and everything is for him. He's over all things. Why does he do that? You don't see that in some of the other epistles, but we've got to remember that epistles are written for an occasion. They're written to a certain people, a certain time and place, And there's a reason, and Paul has heard back from Epaphras that there's something going on there. And he starts out praising them for what God's doing and and praying for them. And and we had a little insight last week, and we'll get some more insight next week. But there's probably a reasonable inference that commentators make, and we should take as reading through this, that there are teachers 
talking about fullness in some other way that is not dependent upon Christ, this completion or fullness. In a sense, it seems that they're hearing these echoes, these voices out there saying, you made a good start, but you need to add more to be full, to be complete. You're not there. You, you need maybe some special knowledge or some insight, visions, or, or, or you worship angels, or you need to add some kind of practices to your life. And, and it seems that some of the elementary principles, going back to last week that we read about in the passage, or how to placate maybe some of these other spirits that are around there. They're not relying on Christ, these voices. And, and so this letter is preemptive to this church so that they wouldn't go after those voices. And Paul's burdened to see them endure in their faith. Remember his prayer back in chapter 1, verse 9. He's praying that, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You've got to know the fullness of this. Be filled with it so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge, your, your personal knowledge of God, and you're strengthened with all power. And and why? So that you would be steadfast, that you would have patience, you would endure in Christ. Paul is part of that means of helping them endure. He makes the the prayer, but he also, he's going to give them the wisdom to endure as well, so that the Spirit might apply that to their lives. And of course, that's that's why we're interested in preaching the whole counsel of God. It's just not, what's the minimum to believe and then let you on your own? The means to keep us on This journey towards our treasure in Christ is is the preaching and teaching and and our understanding of the word as well. So Paul, being part of those means, wants to show them the emptiness of anything else and the fullness that's in Christ. And he does this by reasserting what he touched on earlier in chapter 1. First of all, who Christ is, and then he elaborates on what he's done What's he done for us? What do you have in him? And this is all tied to this fullness language, as we'll see. But so who he is. Verse 9. He goes on. What, what's it about him that makes him the supreme and sufficient Savior? Amazing statement here. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All, the the entirety of the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus Christ bodily. This is one of the most direct statements on the deity of Christ. And this isn't just some God-like quality. I went and looked up the New World Translation, which is used by the the Jehovah Witnesses, that they, they deny that he is God, he's a created being. And their translation is that it's in him that all the fullness of the divine quality dwells. They make it a quality. Now, the noun used in this is different than a noun that means divine quality. There is a word which could have been used just fine. But this noun here doesn't mean that. Paul's trying to say that the essence of God, undivided in its whole fullness, dwells in Christ bodily. Not just a little bit of deity, not just a reflection of deity, not a third of deity, the fullness of deity. This is hard to understand without the doctrine of the Trinity. It's still even beyond our comprehensions, but we should expect that the God who made everything is is more complex, bigger than we could even understand. But he's revealed something in Scripture. If we just had this statement, we might say, okay, the one God is now Jesus Christ. The one God is taken on body and flesh. But we, we also have this sense that Scripture says that God the Father is separate from God the Son, who is Jesus Christ. And then they're both separate from the Holy Spirit. Even in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul is talking about both the Father and Jesus Christ are referenced. So there's clearly two persons, and these two persons are both referenced as God. And the Bible affirms what? There's only one God. So this is how we infer that, okay... There is one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is Paul doing here? 
Jesus isn't just some junior deity or some lieutenant of a deity. Everything in essence the Father is, the Son is. Everything you need from God, we have in Christ. This isn't just some theological nuance or point. It's important for finding Christ as all-sufficient and all we need. So, So Jesus teaches, John 14, Philip says, look, Jesus, show us the Father. What does Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the image of the invisible God, right? So we we go to the Gospel of John back in chapter 1. No one has ever seen God, the only God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. This one at his side is God, John 1, 1. In verse 14 in John 1, this God who was referred to as the Word, he became flesh and dwelt among us. He's full of grace and truth, that fullness language. And so Paul rightly says in concord with the Gospel of John that all the fullness of deity dwells in him bodily. He dwells, he presently dwells now. He he was God before the incarnation, during his incarnation, since his incarnation, he presently dwells And and yet, he dwells bodily. He's also man forever. This this God has has taken on flesh, what we call the incarnation, and he is this forever. So what are the implications of this? We talked about what God's doing in history. I will be their God, they shall be my people, and I will dwell with them. The way that God will dwell with his people in all eternity Includes Jesus. It's in Jesus. It's fascinating in Revelation. You, you see the Lamb and you see the Father, but there's one throne. No one's seen God. We, we've seen glory. We see manifestations, but we will dwell with Him in Christ. There's going to be a, a banquet that, that we're with Him, and we're, we're going to see that more fleshed out as we go along on, on, on what is the treasure that we have in Christ. He who has the Son has the Father, John says in 1 John. This this one, he's the head. He's the rule over every other rule and authority. And so you think you need something else? You think you need something more to to deal with spiritual competitors? You you think you need to add to that? You, You think you need to worship angels? That's what... He talks about in Colossians later on. You don't need it, Paul is saying. Jesus is over everything that you might think that is out there. Christ made the angels. Christ rules the angels. Why worship and seek from the creature rather than the creator? Why worship those who are ruled rather than him who rules? See, that's Christ. But if if Christ is just a created being, then we're just worshiping a, a, a creature again, aren't we? But Paul says, no, that's not what we're doing. Don't let anyone persuade you otherwise. Or think about, maybe in our context we don't go after other spirits in the same way, but we're still a fairly superstitious people. It's all over. Go into a sports locker room. People do certain things, and they're worried about, all right, if I don't do this, it'll bring bad luck. If I do do it, it'll bring good luck. This isn't trusting in the, the sufficiency of Christ over over all these things and seeing him in all of it. Or, or think about maybe some of you come out of a Catholic background where you're venerating saints and Mary or popes even. You, you don't need that. You don't need to add to Christ. Christ is full deity and we are in him. We have access to him. Yet he's still our, our mediator with God. He's both man and God. He can put his hand on both man and God because he is God and he is man. He is the source of our fullness because he is fullness. And that that leads to the second kind of fullness in our passage is is our fullness. Maybe you've heard theologians through the ages have had a way of summarizing what man is lacking in various ways. Not unlike the the sentiment behind a greeting card. 
You've heard the saying that we have a God-shaped hole in us. Right? And only God can fill it. Maybe you've heard of Augustine. He has a prayer that says, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You see, since in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells, he can fill that God-sized hole. He can complete us. This is consistent with what Paul says in verse 10. In him, you have been made complete. This is the same root word for fullness, or the ESV says, in him, you have been filled. The greeting card's right. We need to be completed. And it happens in Christ Our selfhood, the Christian selfhood, is not defined in terms of who we are in and of ourselves. But it's in him. Fascinating language. And it really summarizes what it means to be a Christian. And I don't know if you know this, but Paul never uses the term Christian. I think Christians only use two, three times in the New Testament. But in Christ, in him, language is all over. This relationship is pictured as a marital union. Paul wrote Ephesians probably the same time as Colossians. And if you go to chapter 5 there, Paul shows something about this. He's giving instructions to husbands and wives. And he's talking about how husbands should love their wives. Wives should submit to the husbands. And he goes through this whole exchange on what this should look like, but he gets down to verse 31 of chapter 5, and, and he's talking about a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife or joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is what we think about as, as union in a marriage. And then he goes on and says in verse 32, this, this mystery is profound, saying that this refers to Christ and the church. This marital union refers to Christ and Christians. He's saying that human marriage was actually designed on the eternal pattern that God intended for the relationship between Christ to his people. Marriage between a man and a woman is a mini model, a proclamation of Christ in the church. This marital love and oneness portrays, it images forth the relationship between Christ and the church. I think about one of my wife and I's prayers is that we would more and more image forth Christ in the church and in our relationship, a you know, picture of what it's to be like. Of course, we fall short, but we know that it can only happen if each of us leans on Christ, if we find our completion in him. Why? Because marriage is an ultimate. Children aren't ultimate. Christ is ultimate. He completes us. In him, you've been made complete. And Martin Luther, he wrote a little book called The Freedom of the Christian. And he saw the marriage image when he articulated his gospel discovery in 1520. I was reading an author's interaction with this work, and he saw marriage as explaining the gospel. He talks about to be a Christian is like the story of a great king marrying a harlot. The harlot can't make herself the great king's wife by anything she does or her performance but he becomes the king's wife by his wedding vow. And, and through that, she becomes his. And the king says to her, all that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. And so he gives to her the status of royalty and all that's his. But in response, she turns to him, and we can compare this to faith. And says, all that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. But what does she have? And what do we have? But our sin. He gives us all that he has. He gives us life and grace. And he takes on all of our sin. 
What does the king do? What does Christ have to offer his bride? What do we share in with him? Well, Paul continues to elaborate, verses 11 to 15, on how our state of fullness comes into being, and that's our next point, is fellowship. Fellowship is another way of saying participation. You know what participation is. When you participate in a game with others, you partake together, you share in it, you have that in common. You're sharing in the experience. This concept of being in Christ, the Bible says, leads to us having shared, participated in things with him. So that's what we see in verses 11 to 13. In him, you are circumcised. You were buried with him in baptism. You were raised with him, verse 12. You were made alive with Christ. So, so we're in him and we participate things with him. When we are in union with him, we somehow share in his death and resurrection. This is what he has to offer us, and we share in that. So what's going on with that? And he uses some word pictures here that, that correspond to realities. He uses these pictures of circumcision and, and the term baptism. You know, how does circumcision relate to baptism and who should be baptized? It's been debated for generations, right? You have some argue, okay, in the Old Testament, who was circumcised? All males were circumcised, just males. And particularly when a child of an Israelite was born, on the eighth day they'd become circumcised. Well, so shouldn't believers do the same thing? Their children, shouldn't they be baptized? Isn't there a correspondence between the Old Covenant? Shouldn't we at least have what they have as a sign and a symbol? Of course, others argue that only believers should be baptized. Well... If you've studied our statement of faith, you, you realize that we only baptize believers, and, and I, I think it's important to understand why. I think Paul helps us with that here. In the Old Testament, physical circumcision was, of course, instituted by God as an outward sign of the covenant between him and his people. Again, specifically males. On the eighth day, a child would take on this outward sign, a male child, of the covenant that God made with the nation. So that was the external outward aspect of it. But already in the Old Testament, circumcision was also being used as a metaphor for an inner spiritual change. Moses himself in Deuteronomy 36, he he starts talking about the circumcision of the heart. This is something internal. The the, the external was a pointer to what was needed internally. The circumcision of the heart, Moses portrays that as being necessary for loving God from the heart. That's what we really need. Not an outward act done by man, but an inward act done by God. Because our hearts are hardened. They're separated from God, and and we need something to happen. And Paul takes up this concept, claiming that it is the circumcision, a non-physical circumcision done without hands, that marks a person as belonging to God's people. He's referring to that spiritual aspect of the Old Testament, the circumcision of the heart, made without hands. And he's making an antithesis implicitly to external circumcision. Internal was always what was needed. So Paul says, in Christ, that was done. Not the removing of just a piece of skin, but the removing of a weak, frail, bodily state called the flesh that's under the mastery of sin and that's unable to do anything Godward on its own. Paul says, again, when joined to Christ, that state ended. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's connected to the heart. A new heart. He describes this circumcision then with pictures referring to Christ's own death and resurrection. If we follow the flow here, he says, You were circumcised, in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up, directly connected to the circumcision we received. We share then in Christ's death and resurrection in baptism. He's, he's connecting this picture of baptism. 
His death, that, that, that pictures the penalty for sin being put upon him, resurrection, the new life in Christ. That's what's pictured in water baptism, being immersed in the water and coming out. So we might start to ask, okay, so what's Paul talking about here? Is he talking about this, this external act of water baptism or some spiritual baptism to, to match the inner spiritual circumcision of the heart? What's he talking about here? Well, we, we sometimes make distinctions that the authors aren't trying to make. What do I mean? The New Testament really doesn't show much difference between someone who's had baptism and a believer. What do I mean? Sometimes we come to faith and people wait for years sometimes before they're baptized. That's not really what happened in the New Testament. People believed they were baptized. Right? So when someone was converted, well, we just have baptism. Remember Acts? They believed 3,000 were baptized. I don't know how much water they had to do that, but anyhow, they were baptized. There wasn't really a consideration of an unbaptized Christian. The New Testament doesn't talk that way. So when we see the term baptism, when it's used, it stands for this whole conversion, initiation, experience. So obviously, there's a spiritual element being referred to here. That's the whole connection. Yet the external water baptism was the the outward sign, the testimony that one belongs to Christ. And it's really like a wedding ceremony. Going back to the picture of the gospel and marriage. Think about marriage. When does a person move from the state of singleness to the state of being married? When does that happen? The ceremony. Right? It usually happens at the ceremony. They both make pledges, and then now I pronounce you husband and wife. Now, theoretically, I suppose one could get married on paper for, from a judge without a ceremony. He's overseas, she's here, and they make some legal paperwork to make it binding. But that's not typical, is it? We have this ceremony to, to commemorate the new status the being joined together, the transfer. It's the initiation into it. And and the same should be for baptism. It's the initiation rite in which, by faith, one says that I am his and he is mine. By faith, it says here. Faith. That's associated with a heart that trusts God. That's what faith is. It's therefore associated with the new heart, the heart made without hands. Now listen, this is different from the Old Testament outward sign of physical circumcision. In the Old Covenant, you didn't have to have faith to get in. You just had to get in by natural birth, by being born, right? You were born and you were part of the covenant people because you were a Jew, But that's not how the new covenant works. How do we get into the new covenant? Not by physical birth, but by new birth. The nature of the new covenant is that you are in it, by definition, because of a new heart. That's what was pointed to by Moses in Deuteronomy. That's what Jeremiah talks about in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, where God gives you a new heart. I put my spirit within you. That's why we don't practice infant baptism, because the way we get into the new covenant is by new birth. And so only believers are baptized, and they have the sign which corresponds to the reality of what circumcision of the heart really is. Does that make sense? And for the believer, then, baptism really is like a wedding ceremony. I'm one with him. He completes me. You don't say that as an infant. I pledge my life to him, and he's made me his own. We do a baptism class here. We, we teach about baptism, and, and sometimes the testimonies, this is right, and, and people say, I'm getting baptized because of obedience to my Lord. And that's all they say. And that's right, but it's so much more. It's like a marriage. I am his. He is mine. And it's a beautiful ceremony that's to be a remembrance of having faith. 
and having him saved me and him made his pledge to keep me forever. What a different picture. And he's given us that, even as he's given us the Lord's Supper as a tangible reminder of the gospel, of what he's done for us. This is a a huge reality pointed to in baptism, this forever union. Can you imagine a wedding ceremony? There's the vows. It's like, Penelope, I'm marrying you out of obedience. (laughs) Kind of diminishes it a little bit, doesn't it? But once... I've entered into that state of union. I have all the benefits and privileges of being joined to him. It's a serious thing, but a joyful thing. And it brings freedom. To our last point, we've talked about fullness and fellowship and now freedom. In this relationship is where there's real freedom. Verse 13, Paul reviews where we were before and where we are now and the freedom we have. Where were we? We were dead in our transgression and the uncircumcision of your flesh. This is the condition of everyone who's not in Christ. We we lived in sin. We lived not caring or, or able to do the greatest commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We turned away. We violated God's law. We spurned him. And this is the condition of uncircumcision, as we said before, going back to that. We had a heart problem. Of course, our problem wasn't just commandment breaking and the guilt that came from it. If it was, the solution would be what? Commandment keeping. And then we just have another works-based religion. We just start adding restraints and do's and don'ts. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. We we pursue these things of self-abasement, the do's and don'ts. But later, at the end of chapter 22, these things have no value against continuing in sin. More works isn't what makes us right to God, and it's not what gives us power and victory over sin. It's seeing Christ as what completes me and wanting to follow all that he is, being joined to him. See, our main problem without Christ is is that we prefer anything to God, and we look for completeness elsewhere. Going back, that's why we need the new heart. We need the new life. But, but also, since our relationship before Christ has been severed with God because of our sin, the relationship can only be restored by the removal of sin. That which separates us from God has to be removed. We can't have God. We can't be complete in him without forgiveness. Boy, the world tries to get rid of our guilt in so many different ways, doesn't it? We try and redefine sin. We try and add works to make self-atonement. Or we psychologize it away, saying that I have everything in me to be complete. It won't work because we need to be forgiven by the one that we've offended And that's what we have in Christ. Verse 13 again. He he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. All of them. Past, present, and future. Yes, he's forgiven my past sin. but, But when I'm joined to him and I have all the benefits of forgiveness, it's always there. It's a package. So I think about that. And I'm saying the Lord did it. It's all of grace. And he gives this vivid word picture here. Verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And this is a picture of a document. It's a certificate of debts that we're obligated to pay. So, so all of us, whether we know it or not, have an obligation of allegiance to our maker. Okay, this is why when we start with evangelism, somehow we need to get to, to where God is, who God is. Because God made us, he owns us. We don't have the right, we don't have the authority to determine what we're about, what's right and wrong on our own. Only God does. And, and so, because he made us, we have an obligation. 
I owe God obedience to his will. But our sin stands as conclusive evidence that we have failed to give God that allegiance. And so that record is against us. It's hostile to us because it condemns us, saying that we deserve death. But that record was nailed to the cross. There's another word picture here. It was a common practice in those days that a written accusation would be put above the criminal. Remember Jesus on the cross? King of the Jews was his accusation. We have an accusation And in God's sight, in Christ, our accusation was nailed to the cross. And because Christ was nailed there, our debt has been paid because that's what he was doing on the cross. The wrath of God for our sin was poured out on him. And we can now be forgiven completely. He's taken it completely out of the picture. It has no more bearing on our case. The sins I did yesterday, today, and tomorrow... What does this do for us? Union with Christ gives us a precious, a beautiful, life-changing assurance that shapes our whole life. It should shape the whole nature of our Christian life. If I've sinned, I'm still his. It doesn't say just go out and sin. But we're not quite like Jesus yet. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us unrighteousness because we're in this relationship with him. He's not going to hold it against us. It can cause a relational wedge, but, but I'm his. It means I don't have to despair as to how, how will God look at me. He sees me in Christ. And doesn't that change all my motivations for, for how I live life? How I deal with the hardships, like in Colossians, boy, you, you, need to, you need to do something to maybe appease someone, works of asceticism, and, and listen to angels and, and get some enlightenment here. My motivation is I don't need to appease God, whether through spirits or angels or my works. I, I don't need to live in the fear of man. I can have confidence before God in Christ now, today. Notice that this fullness, it's not just something in the future. You have been made complete, verse 10. Not that I don't need to grow in living that out. Paul encourages us in the the rest of the letter, and he labors to that end. He prays for it, that, that we would walk worthy. But this is something that we have already and need to come to a deeper treasuring. Because this is what we have in him. It's nailed to the cross. That song, It Is Well With My Soul, so captures the point of this verse. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. The reality of forgiveness and this canceling of our debt It's affirmed for us in the breaking of bread and the taking of this cup. That's what we're going to remember today. I want to bring up one point further on our freedom, though, before we go to that. It's not just the penalty that we're free from, but, but the power of those who are against us doesn't compare to what we have in Christ. There's a freedom from being enslaved to other masters. Verse 15 these other rulers, authorities, or or whatever we're we're thinking is out there, Christ has has shamed them. That's the sense of public display. It's an open disgrace. He's he's disarmed them, or or better, disrobed them. This is a picture of a conquering king who, when he's won the battle, what's he do? He, He seizes the opposing kings, and the first thing he does is disrobe them of all their kingly garments and along with that any weapons because they're not kings anymore. And he parades them behind him and they're shamed. And now there is a new king. And I'm joined to this victorious king. 
And you are too if you've trusted in Christ. So other powers and principalities and rulers, authority, human realm or spiritual realm, they don't compare. So don't fear them. Don't submit to them any longer. Christ is our new allegiance. And he is the victor. And I'm in him. And nothing can ultimately defeat me. So I'm just so reminded then of that that victorious proclamation at the the end of Romans chapter 8. Verse 34, who can condemn us? Who can condemn us? Christ is the one who's the judge, but this Christ is the one who died for us. And he was raised. He's interceding for us. And who will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ? Nothing. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, dangerous. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If I understand all that Christ is and that he completes me, what a treasure I have. And so back in verse 6, so walk in him. And Father, help us to do that. Help us to see what a treasure we have in Christ now. Even as we await his return in that glorious day, when there'll be a a total consummation of this union, we know that we belong. We belong to him. And Father, if there's here those who don't understand Christ and haven't joined themselves to him by faith, by your spirit, making them alive, we pray that you would bring repentance and faith and bless us all for Christ's sake. Amen.